welcome back to Ever Today, Dr. Yohora Williams, and we're talking about another Supreme Court decision lost in the coverage of last week's health care decision. Good to have you on the show. Good seeing you. So the top court took a look at life without parole for juveniles. Bring us up to speed. Well, there were two cases, one from Arkansas and one from Alabama, both involving 14-year-olds who committed or were involved in crimes that resulted in homicides. And they were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The court took a look at that and decided that it's a violation of the Eighth Amendment's provision against cruel and unusual punishment for mandatory life sentences without parole to be applied to juveniles. All right, so meaning if a juvenile commits a crime, they can be sentenced to life, but they have a possibility of parole. Exactly, and that's been some of the misunderstanding of this case. It doesn't free anyone, and it certainly doesn't take life sentences off the table for juveniles. It simply says that judges and juries should have an opportunity to consider two things, the age of the offender, uh, the nature of the crime, and that you can't take parole off the, you know, you've got to hold out some hope for these offenders. Um, so life without the possibility of parole would be a, a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Well, let me ask you, what defines a juvenile? Uh, is it 14? Is it 11? Is it 18? Well, the four dissenters in this case, Laura, dealt extensively with that issue, and they, they see it as some sense arbitrary. W what distinguishes a 17-year-old from an 18-year-old? Now, the court historically has defined 18, under the age of 18 is the issue here, um, as a juvenile. Uh, the question is, and, and those uh, distinctions aren't necessarily arbitrary when we consider you have to be 18 in order to vote, uh, to, to um, drink, you have to be 21. Mm -hmm. So developmentally, they look to the medical community um, in terms of defining what a juvenile is, and under 18 has been the standard. Has the court always set that line at 18? Um, historically, yes. The states have, have vacillated, so oh. you have different states that define that differently, but for the most part, 18 across the board. All right, so why is this such an important ruling? Well, for a couple of reasons. This is the second case in, in less than a decade, the first being Roper versus Simmons, which invalidated the death penalty for juveniles, in which the court is saying we've got to look and evaluate punishments for juvenile offenders. It's important because they go back to a case from 1958 called Trot versus Dulles, which really expanded our understanding of the Eighth Amendment, in which the court ruled that in terms of punishment, we have to look at evolving standards of decency that mark progress in a maturing society. As we become more mature as a society, are there certain things that we've done in the past that we want to take off the table? Consider that at one point in this country, drawing and quartering or hanging uh, were considered legitimate punishments. We don't do that anymore. Um, the last public whipping in the United States, 1965 in the state of Delaware, we don't whip people in public anymore. So That's surprising. 1965 is not that long ago. That's, not at that, all. that's surprising. People really misunderstand the Eighth Amendment. Can you help simplify and help us understand it? Well, it's interesting because it, it falls into two camps that argue over its meaning. It does prov uh, have a provision against cruel and unusual punishment, and it's important that we understand that there's a difference between cruel and unusual. Mm. Cruel meaning something that's excessive, and that could mean, um, in cases not even involving the death penalty, paddling of students at school. Right. Um, Unusual meaning, has it become, and this was the case in Delaware, uh, or the pillory, which went out of practice in 1911 in this country, um, has it become so obscure, so rare, that it's an anomaly and it's, you know, the, the court would consider or, the, or people would consider it to be kind of passe. And so those are the two provisions. That's how they work in tandem. And getting back to the decision, does this, in essence, end life sentences for juveniles? Not, not at all. In fact, um, as many critics have pointed out, of the decision, not only does it not end it, it simply says that you can't have these state mandated uh, mandatory uh, sentences without the possibility of parole. So a, a juvenile can still get life in prison, but it's simply saying that you have to allow the, the, them to review the case over time. You have to hold out the hope for these young people that there is some form of rehabilitation. And what defines life? Some states say 30 years. Some say life means life. Is there a standard? There is no standard, and it's interesting that these two cases came from Arkansas and Alabama because in some sense those are the worst offenders in terms of life not having, a, life meaning 25 years, for example, or 30 years. So life in those states typically means life. Um, the old cradle of the Confederacy, as they call it, those states that are, are part of the Deep South, the Bible Belt, so on and so forth. And so the argument here is that, again, not taking the power of, of prosecutors to commit someone to um, life without parole, but simply saying you've got to give the opportunity for the judge and the jury to consider mitigating factors. And then you also have to give this young person who's in jail, because then a life sentence would be tantamount to death. What you're saying is, in essence is that you're going to die in prison. 
And with young people, the point is to try and rehabilitate. Can you just give us some closing thoughts? Does this case decision end this? Not at all. It's a 5-4 decision. We saw the same thing in Roper versus Simmons. And this is the interesting thing about Trop versus Dulles is that as we evolve, we, we assume that we're moving toward eliminating some of these things like uh, the death penalty, life without possibility of parole. parole. It's a uh, possibility we go back in the other direction, that things get to a point. You know, people have argued that look at juvenile crime is on the rise. And even though statisticians say that the death penalty and life imprisonment don't deter crime, people still see these as a panacea to try to, to end crime. All right, well, this is a very interesting case, and we could go on for the whole hour, but we'll have to invite you back for another time to just continue this and other topics. Thanks for being here. Always great seeing you. Thank you. Good seeing you, too.